it's really important to get a vision about how personal it is with the Lord in our seeking him regarding the church. Because I know because of our culture, the way we were raised and the way that we have been taught in the past, growing up or you know, through our parents, just in society itself, the church is something that, well, it's just not doing a good job or, you know, take it or leave it. You know, we'll, we'll get more, maybe more inspiration on the Internet and maybe that's better. And I guess in a way that's the church because they're speaking the word of God. And, and so we have this vision of the church, even though we've taught much against it, still our reflex, I think, is that the church is an institution it's something separate from us. And when it comes to our relationship with God, it really doesn't have a place directly to fit in. I mean, maybe in some ways you can, you know, if you kind of make your brain work, you can find a place for it, but it doesn't come natural and it doesn't seem very personal. So when people are talking about the relationship with the Lord or seeking the Lord, they can quickly talk about I mean, hopefully, numbers of people can quickly speak about how the Lord has been revealing himself to them. And it usually has nothing to do with the church at all, but it has something to do about a lesson or something the Lord is redirecting them about and calling them to some sort of repentance or learning a new truth. And that's all good. But there's a way that we're relating to the Lord when we omit the church that really is and I want you to hear this the right way, it's um, dishonoring. Now, I know we don't mean it that way, but, but it's, it's like uh, we are objectifying the Lord once again by not really seeing how deep and intimate is his union with the church. We just think, you know, the church is over there, and it would be good if it got its act together. We know the problems with the church, and, you know, we're over here, and, uh, and we're hoping for the best for the church. But the church is Jesus, me, and you, inseparable. You cannot parse Jesus out of the church because he united himself to the church in a very intimate way that goes beyond any natural conception of intimacy. It is much deeper, much more intimate, and much more personal. And to ignore the church in our relationship with God is something that we have to repent of. We have to understand that we've been taught this, and it's a strange doctrine. I mean, there's a lot of strange things in our society. Agape love is, is strange for most people. Most people still don't understand biblical love as opposed just to romantic conceptions of love. Or, or it's strange to people when you talk about love being building up other people. Or it's strange when you talk about covenant and how that it's important to be loyal to the Lord and to one another because that's a part of what the gospel is teaching. You know, you can hear it, but still people are saying, I'm not making connections. And it's because... We, when we come before the Lord, it really is, I mean, again, I don't mean this in any way to draw us up short, but I have to speak the truth you want me to, and we need it, is that um, it's very self-centered. Our spirituality is very self-centered. So when you look at the epistle of Ephesians and you see him talking about spiritual warfare, and he's talking about the armor of God, which we will explore sometime. But at the end, he's saying, and pray for one another as a part of a spiritual warfare. Pray for one another. And I don't know. I mean, I'm sure numbers of us do pray for one another. But I don't know if we are praying in the sense of that we could be gathered as church. So we might pray for personal needs. Again, that's not bad. None of these things I'm saying uh, about our aberration is bad in and of itself. It's only bad for what's missing. And so it becomes lopsided. And so people don't have a lot of excitement about the church generally 
and they feel quite disconnected personally and spiritually from the church. But I just, I want to really just talk about this area. I was going to talk about more about seeking specifically and what that could do for our life together, but I think I need to really build this foundation that we have to repent out of a certain individualism that makes it difficult to us to understand how deeply in connection we are with God and one another in the church. And that that reality of intimacy and connectedness is going to always be there for eternity. So, you know, we always say, you know, we're just praying God, whatever is in heaven, be on the earth, and we're hardly ever thinking about relationships. You might think about miracles, you might think about other things that need to be made right, you know, healing. But we don't think, and Lord, just restore the honor due relationships that reflect the sacredness of our union with you and one another. I've never heard that prayed in any assembly that I know of. So I, uh, and I think we need to rediscover just how personal this is with the Lord. So I look at, we can look at Ephesians 5, in Ephesians 5, verse 28, you know, it's a passage that talks about marriage, but I'm reading, I'm reading from it to talk about the nature of the church, which clearly Paul is wanting to emphasize there, not, not marriage, but the nature of the relationship of the church, Jesus, if it's the church that teaches us about marriage. It's the other way around, you know. We're supposed to look at Jesus in the church and say, oh, that's how I'm supposed to be married, rather than i got to find a good church because I need improvement with my marriage and I need some teaching. It's like the church is supposed to be the example and the model of how you relate and, with the Lord and one another. And, of course, there you go. There you got the template of how we're supposed to be relating in our marriages. Again, most people don't think that. Ephesians 5, 28. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. By the way, he's using that analogy because he's getting it from Jesus. Jesus is loving others like the way he loves himself. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Okay, so that means, it goes on, just as Christ also does the church. So Jesus, if you want to feel cherished and nourished by Jesus, it's important to restore or um, enter into an understanding of church by which you can receive nourishment and where you can experience the cherishing love of God. That really is to be expected. But of course, if we're not thinking of the church as this communion of love and this relationship that's a covenant that's built for forever, then, and we're not thinking that God really has much to do with the church right now in reference to our relationship with him, then it's going to be hard for us to see that. But Paul's really clear here. So he says, just as also Christ does the church, because we are members of his body, which is an astounding statement that we can get used to, unfortunately, but it's like that there's something about Jesus that if you remove his members, he's not Jesus anymore. I mean, uh, Ridley, I mean, it's kind of a weird way to think, but that's true. There's something about the identity of Jesus Christ as Savior, as the Messiah, that isn't that way if you dissect out his people, and his relationship with them. It says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great. Marriage, that's a great mystery, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. So we got to go there, and we got to understand what this means from our heart, not our heads, because it's really personal with the Lord. So if um, maybe next to our children, or maybe, maybe there isn't degrees at all, but, but if all of a sudden uh, you saw someone beating up your husband or beating up your wife in public, 
you wouldn't say, that doesn't really have anything directly to do with me. Because, see, I'm not getting bruised. I'm not bleeding. That's their blood. You would think, well, that's extremely callous. How could you think that way? Well, that really is a very poor analogy because it doesn't even begin to broach the immediacy and the imminent and personal nature of the Lord with his people. The Lord is saying, you really, when you talk about my church, you're talking about me. Don't act like I'm separate from my church. Don't feel relieved that Jesus isn't a part of the church because it's such a mess. The Lord is not asking you to do that. He's asking you to pray for his church, to care for his church. So in this case, if I see my wife being beat up, I'm going to go in the middle of the crowd, and I'm going to rescue her. I'm not going to say, I I hope the best. I'm going to go in, and I'm going to intervene. And the Lord is wanting us to have such a relationship with him that we understand his heart for his church so that we cannot just callously stand by and talk about all the bad things that are going on in the church as if they aren't us, as if it has nothing to do with the Lord or us, as if, you know, Jesus, he's out there, the church is out there, and, you know, we're here. But the reality is we're here, Jesus is here, and it's the church, and he's saying, I want you to love one another the way I love you, and that's a full-time job. That's all your heart, and that's the call. So we can't be distancing ourselves, and where we feel like there's a distance, okay, that's a good thing to seek the Lord about. Why? Why do we feel distant from his church, which is his body? And again, The imagery that we've talked about in the Eucharist is that we're the members of Christ. This coming before him in communion isn't something that you and I can do privately because it is a communal expression of what it means to live with God. And we live with God with our brothers and sisters. And the Lord himself is the one who who leads us. So see, like we're invited to a wedding. (laughs) We're invited to a wedding. And so we take our place in the pew. But all of a sudden, we look up front, and it's Jesus. And he's saying, no, I'm not inviting you as a guest. You're my bride. I want you up here. This wedding has to do with you and me. The angels may be watching and celebrating with us, but there's a way that this involves you in a way it doesn't involve them. So please don't stay in your seat and watch. That's like some people do at the church. I hope it works out all right. It won't then. (laughs) Because if we are seeing ourselves distant and distinct from being with him, because the Holy Spirit has made it, given us such a relationship with the Son of God that he's desiring to wash us with the word of God, wash us in baptism, which is surrender of our whole lives to him with one another to bring us in to a relationship with him so that we look like this marriage was made in heaven. The father said, these people I've set aside to be my son's bride. And, and so that's an awesome thing. We have to put ourselves there. So in truth, I know that people may may say this and they don't understand, and that's okay, but we want to come into an understanding. But, But in truth, you really can't say, I love Jesus, but I don't love his church because it's such a mess. Um, He is united with his church in a deeper relationship than, of course, I have with my wife or you have with your wife or husbands, that the relationship is so, so close that... The Lord makes a reference to the church as if it it was him that we're talking about. So, yeah, I'm I'm thinking about that um, when Paul's first revelation of the church, 
The first revelation of the church was on the road of Damascus. When he had uh, fallen to the ground with a bright light and what he thought was thunder, a loud voice, and he heard the voice, and it was in the Hebrew language, and Paul records saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? We definitely would want to write it in our culture to say, why are you persecuting my followers? Why don't you give them a break? Or why are you doing this to my people? Why does he say me? I mean, that's strange, brothers and sisters. You are persecuting me when you're persecuting, because he goes on. He says, because <clears throat> Paul is saying, well, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. So that's why Paul is able to say, I'm the greatest of all sinners. I was persecuting the Lord. The connection is that deep. And Jesus sees the church, sees this habitation of the temple of God as an expression and as a manifestation of the presence of his Father. So for him, it's not just being super zealous about something off the side. He really cares about his church. So I remember that passage that starts in around John 2, 15. Jesus made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And those who were selling the doves, he said, take these things away, stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples, watching that, remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. That is, Jesus is really invested in the church. He is consumed by the church. Salvation is union with God in the church. It is to be a manifestation of the gospel and evidence and testimony that the gospel is true. When you go into a temple during the times of the New Testament, and if you went to a pagan temple, you went inside there, and you saw what was happening there, you got a sense of that God, whether it was prostitution or whether what kind of idolatry was going on. And Paul was making an analogy uh, to, to the people that he was addressing. He was saying, you know, those expressions, you've got to understand that we're different. You are the church. And if you want to know what's going on with me, you look at my people. You look at how they relate, how they speak, what they're living for, what they give their time to, and you'll see me. And so that's what Paul was always speaking to the Corinthians about. He's saying, you know, the way you're treating people around the Eucharist is really against the whole point of the gospel, which was bring, to bring people into union with me. You're acting like these people have nothing to do with you or me, that you can do whatever you want according to your habits, to your culture and your style, and just say a certain prayer that looks like you're connected with me, but you're really totally off. So that he can say this, that in one place, well, in 1 Corinthians 3, 17, he talks about that he who destroys the temple, God will destroy you and the temple. Pretty strong word. And the reference is, what they were doing in the assembly was so antagonistic of what the nature of the church of God was, that if someone was bent on not encouraging communion with God and one another as brothers and sisters and as members of the body of Christ, if they were not working toward that end, but asserting themselves separate and removed from the whole, you will be destroying the church of God. And because you're setting off that bomb, you happen to be right in front of it, and you yourself will explode. The very source of salvation that's to be made available in the church, you've just ruined for others and yourself. And he really wants people to get that. The how intimate the relationship of God is with how we live.
So when Jesus was going into the temple and overturning tables, the Jews said to him in verse 18, what sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. So now Jesus is going to speak in confusing ways again. And they said, the Jews said to him, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it up in three days? Verse 21, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. I don't think we still get that. And we have, to, we have to rediscover it because the reality is it is the Lord's church. It's not ours. It's not for our support or just our mutual encouragement here and there. It is to manifest what goes on in the temple of God, what God is like. And the reality is, is if we see God and we say, I'm seeing God, I'm seeing that it's more than what I thought it was. I want you to teach me about that. I want you to help me understand what revelation you want to offer the world through your people. And I think I'm not making those connections. So the first thing I'm seeking you about is, Lord, tell me, show me, empower me that I might be able to pray the prayers that you would want me to pray so that your church would look like Jesus himself lives there, and manifests his presence through those people that are united with and through him, with one another. That's the call of God. So when we're, so for instance, one thing, Ephesians 4.12, which many of us know, he said he gave some as apostles, and prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors, for the building up of the body, for the equipping of the saints. I hardly see that anywhere. I mean, not just here. I hardly see that anywhere. Well, no point for being discouraged. You do not have to be discouraged. We just never have sought him for that realization as if it was really important because it is to equip the saints for service. How many people are a part of a community or of a church understanding that their relationship with the Lord and to that people is helping them learn how to love the Lord and love one another to manifest the gospel through their particular service, general, that is the small things every day, and specific, that is particular giftings that he gives. And how many people can really live without it? And we would say, we could probably do that. But Jesus is saying, hey, look, I'm consumed with this. My body must look like my body. And I want you to seek me. If you care about my bride, if you are my bride, if you care about my people, which is more than a people, but is a communion and a level of intimacy that only God himself could manifest through the blood of Christ to make a people so joined with the Son of God by the Holy Spirit that they would be called me by Jesus. Why are you persecuting me? We are the me of Jesus. It's not just we. We are his me. And the Lord is wanting us to repent into that reality. Stop being me, that is, what this church does for me, and be the me that is the Lord to manifest his presence. And I'm telling you, in the last day, he may not ask this question, but for a way of seeing all this, if there's something about we wanted to see in church that we didn't, weren't able to see while we walked this earth, I don't want him to ask me this. Why didn't you talk to me about this? I would have given you whatever you needed but you never talk to me about this. Why didn't you talk to me about this? And that's really a good question to ask before we get to the throne. And the Lord has an answer. 
and it is going to remove us from the individualist, individualistic and individualized view of the church as a gathering to get certain things done, whether it's preaching the gospel or healing people or giving teachings to being a people that actually are a house of God, where people can discern the presence of God by otherworldly love, which really isn't here for ourselves, but for him, our bridegroom, whom we love with all that we are. So seeking the Lord for his church is foundational to what it means to be in Christ. And the Lord wants us to engage him personally in this level so that whatever he puts on your heart and my heart, whatever he speaks to us prophetically or through his word about what the church is, we will pray it into being, we will seek him, we will give ourselves, and we'll be consumed with the church the way he was so that the Father might receive the glory that Jesus himself was jealous for when he walked the earth. So that, that be a beginning for us to repent into this understanding of seeking and know that we can just receive everything that the Lord would want us to have if we just turn our attention to the church the way he does and the way he is even right now. Bless you all. Love you.